Are you ready? everyone it is me your favorite actor the hollywood assassin mark schwan for another episode of shot of wrestling my guest is the spartan pitbull himself one of my favorite guys bwf outside the satsujin squad ladies and gentlemen give it up for nikos rikos the spartan pitbull and also add in the other nickname that i get really ticked off that people will forget to mention sometimes or choose not to mention I, I i don't know if it's a fear of stamos or if it's a cadre thing with full house or fuller house or small house or smaller house i don't care it's also the stamos of professional wrestling the stamos of professional wrestling i dude you know i've called a few of your matches before you never told me that one i, I gotta use that i've told many people and for some reason don't get me wrong i love the sport and pitbull nickname that's the first and most but the the stamos of professional wrestling is the other one, and it's just as important. So yeah, now you know going forward. Yeah, well, thank you for educating me. I'm going to have to update my notes when we're done here. Uh, the mm-hmm. stamos of professional wrestling, Nikos Rikos. Yeah. Thank you. Oh my man, how are you holding up, dude? I'm holding up well. I will admit, and uh, I'm not just saying this to piss people off. You know, even though I love doing that, I am not doing my part. Because, I mean, I'm not just walking around aimlessly in public places, coughing and spitting on people, as funny as that would be. But I would go nuts if I did nothing but stay inside and only leave when it's time to get, you know, to go to the grocery store. So, Well, what's even so, open? Uh, I know you're in New Jersey, right? And uh, yeah. I feel like that's, that's just as equally as hit as New York. What else is open over there other than grocery stores? And Are parks open at least? Parks? Uh They've been open, um, Target, you know, a lot of stores. It's really interesting. I saw something earlier today. Um, I work for a small business, uh, a, a personal training studio. And, and uh, one thing I saw today, which whatever, I'm sure some people get irked by it, but it was very true on Facebook. And it said, uh, amazing how you can't catch Corona in major retail stores, but apparently you can only get them in small businesses. Meaning small businesses right now are being held down and closed off, but yet you can still go in Target and you can still buy clothes and toys and whatever else. You can go there for stuff that is not essential. You can still go to vitamin shop. You can still do curbside pickup at Best Buy and whatnot, but yet for some reason, and I, I know the reason why, obviously, the virus but, um, you know, this is really affecting small businesses like ours. I'm doing a lot of uh, FaceTime and virtual training. Thank God for it. But uh, there's a lot more open than I think people realize. And don't get me wrong, that's not a lot of stuff. But which usually whatever goes for New York goes for New Jersey and vice versa. Yeah, I think they, they're all trying to keep it together, well, at least the tri-state area. And which makes sense because, you know, we're all going in about New York and that whole area. Yep. So it makes sense. Um, I just feel like pick a date and stick to it, meaning like I'm not saying open everything immediately a thousand percent, but with restrictions, like whether it's, you know, you can only have your restaurant or your business at this much capacity, at least give everybody a chance to start going back to work. Because right now, a lot of people are going to, in my mind, end up being lazy because they're getting these awesome checks coming in. So before everybody gets into that group, at least start to open up and give everybody a chance because it's going to be a while before people are comfortable going places or you're going to have people that are just going to, you know, jump the gun and, you know, get out of the house immediately and, you know, potentially, yeah. you know, I mean, it's so tricky with this thing. Like, I, of course, I think New York city is, is the toughest part to like, open right away uh, because that had more cases than anywhere else really. Um, oh yeah. Jersey's like, we're, like right up there too. Yeah. Uh, but there are definitely certain places I would say in, in Jersey and New York, 
uh, other regions where it's not hit anywhere near as hard. Um, I think that's something that uh, some states are looking into, opening up things regionally. Uh, I'm not saying reopen everything a thousand percent right away, full blown, like don't have restrictions. But I think at least like let everything reopen up, but put restrictions on it. But at least give the businesses a chance to start that growth again. Or at least for them to figure it out, you know, I mean, like it, it's no... There's no harm, at least, from to try to figure out as far as like maybe doing curbside stuff, like the bigger companies right. or deliveries, because no one's going to come in. To, no one's really going to come to the stores. Right. So, but you know, hey, Nico, going on a more positive note, though, uh, I understand that you and uh, Vicious Vicky you guys just celebrated one year together. So, congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, we did. Uh, somehow, she's been putting up with me. And the fact that she has to hear about my love for Taylor Swift, of course. So a lot of credit to her. Yeah, I will say that. Well, you know, I, I've seen you guys work together. Um, you know, you guys are such a, an awesome couple. You know, we call you the power couple of BWF for so many reasons. Now, you guys being quarantined and everything, how did you spend your, your one year together? Uh, so, let's see. Tuesday, what did we do? We, um, we got from our favorite sushi place. Um, I will have everybody know I paid because I'm good like that. And we literally just, we, we had our sushi, and then we, we watched Lost. And for me, that was, I mean, look, there's nowhere to go anyway. Right, of um, course. And um, honestly speaking, uh, which I know she'll really grimace at hearing this, before this pandemic hit a couple months ago, I just had a feeling like, of, you know, the, a, a spidey sense. And I just said to her, probably back in February, I said, just a heads up, I hate surprise parties. So if you do think that you might be throwing one for me, cancel it in your head. <laughs> cancel it right now. And then Vicky, you know, naturally she hears all of this and went on to plan a surprise party. No. So then the pandemic hit and then it had to be canceled. You know, she, she had to hear it from me where I said, hey, this wasn't one of those, uh, oh, don't do this for me. But deep down, I'm really saying do this for me or I'm just being coy. I'm like, uh-huh. I'm like, first of all, her setup, I'm just going to keep it short. The setup, as I asked her, hey, just out of curiosity, what would you have done to get me to go to this restaurant, blah, blah, blah. She told me the setup, and I said, I would have been on to you within about three and a half seconds. <laughs> so I said, take this as a note. Next time you plan a surprise party, even if the person said don't, you got to plan that better because it would have been a – dead giveaway she was going to lure me into a restaurant that i I have never been to before i've never said i wanted to go to and i'm like why i'm like you know traditionally on the birthday you say hey where do you want to go i said if you would have told me oh we're going here and i would have been like i don't even like this place why are we going here i said that would have been the dead giveaway so (laughs) she's gonna hate me for telling the story but at this point it's all in it needs to be told nature yeah, it's just there was supposed to be a big surprise party that had to get canceled. So that was only going to be a couple days before our anniversary was my birthday. And uh, that's right, they were, they were very close. I, I, yes. I was like, yeah, didn't you actually have a birthday too? Uh, but yes, and okay. Now I know why I was going to bring it back. So she set up this amazing gift. She had a bunch of wrestlers, friends, and families, uh, friends and family. They donated to their choice of, of one of my two favorite rescues. Uh, mainly hamster related, which what they had the choice of the Westchester Rescued Hamster Haven or the Pip Squeakery. A lot of people donated to both in my name. I thought that gift was amazing. That is beautiful. Uh, so long story short, I was as we sat there on Tuesday and we were just enjoying our anniversary dinner, I said, hey, just to bring it back for a second, I told her, I said, I understand what you were doing for my birthday. I said, but whether it's my birthday or anniversary, I go, this is to me like the best way to celebrate whether it's anything big i'm like we're just sitting here not in public just enjoying lost and that's the way i like it so that's where i was going with why i brought up my birthday thing (laughs) no all good man i mean it sounds like you guys no matter what COVID 19 or not i mean that would be an ideal celebration for you guys and um yeah i'm glad you guys had that moment together hopefully you guys have many more years together like that without the virus of course (laughs) Now, Nikos, um, you know, I know you go to like different promotions, everything. I, I, I know you from BWF and, uh, like, you know, we cross paths to BCW sometimes. Uh, but, you know, there are different other promotions that you work at. 
what are the differences between them for you? Do you, do you work a different style in each different one? or? I, you know, I, I, it's, it's going to, to a lot of wrestlers, maybe the fans won't understand, but to a lot of wrestlers, it's going to sound cliche, but the biggest thing that changes from promotion to promotion in terms of uh, what I do in the ring is based on the crowd. So there's times where when I've worked for uh, Crowbar, I used to be in WCW, Mm -hmm. um, Chris Ford, who's also right now a, uh, he's big into physical therapy, chiropractor, I believe, too. He's an amazing guy. When I've worked for him and his promotion, Rescue Mania, it's very much like, uh, you know, guys would describe it as like, oh, this is like an 80s. Like, it's very simple. There's a lot of families here, so you don't have to do anything crazy. Um, But then there's certain promotions you go to in areas where, you know, you look out in the crowd and you see a lot of people wearing shirts from pro wrestling tees. And then you're like, all right, this is the kind of crowd where maybe bust out more of the athletic stuff, more of the hard hitting, the fast paced stuff. Cause that's what, you know, this quote unquote hardcore fan demographic is looking for. Interesting. So, so you can tell it's really, by looking at the fan base. Yeah. And I learned that at a recent seminar that blew my mind. Uh, besides just the crowd, um, in terms of the people walking in, is to actually look at what they're wearing. I actually learned that at a Tommaso Ciampa seminar recently in, in the city, and I've never heard that before, is to not just look at the people, but look at what they're wearing, because if you see a lot of you know Hulk Hogan shirts and things of that nature, you know, okay, like I don't have to do much like in terms of to elicit a reaction, but if you're seeing Bullet Club and things of that nature and very you know niche wow. kind of stuff. That makes a that, lot of sense. That audience is going to be, all right, I want more. I want action. I want hard hitting. I want fast pace. So that's really how my style changes and how I go out there is, all right, I define it as, is this like an 80s show where I can go out there and do some, you know, simple stuff and get a reaction? Or is this more of like, all right, I'm going to have to, you know, kick it up a notch because this crowd wants more. This is the hardcore demographic now. Which style do you prefer the best? Personally, across the board, um, no matter what kind of show it is, at the same time when I say that, I do typically, I, I still have my style regardless. Mm-hmm. I'm not going, I, I don't do, you know, moonsaults or anything. In fact, I rarely use my drop kick, and a couple times that I've busted out in practice, people are like, Jesus Christ, we didn't know you could do a drop kick like that or jump that <laughs> high. But I just don't utilize it a lot. But for me, across the board, like, I'm always more of a ground and pound, being aggressive. Um, you know, I grew up idolizing Goldberg, but I'm not 6'4 and 290. So the guys that I've taken a liking to over the years since being a wrestler is guys like Chris Jericho, Fit Finley, William Regal. One of my trainers and a very, very close friend of mine in the business, Dan Moff, uh, who's now back with Ring of Honor. <sighs> yeah, I pattern, honestly, myself after him a lot, too. This just kind of rugged kind of really physical style um i get ripped on a lot at the wrestle pro uh creative pro new jersey school for getting in there and even during a practice just lighting guys up and um there's usually a thing that is said in practices for the new guys where one of the trainers like a bobby wayward will tell a new guy well you survived getting in the ring with nico's congratulations because people will joke around and say hey dude you know it's practice right because i get in there and I'm trying to, you know, kill when it comes to uh, high I, strikes and whatnot. I see that in every show with you. Whenever I see you perform or whenever you do commentary, you know, you you always bring that intensity. You even from like the get go, from the entrance, uh, you know, you have that look in your eye. You, you're ready to go. Uh, this is still at the end of the day, and I'm going to try not to go on this rant, even though I feel passionately about it. Uh, it's still a competition, and I will say I'm not going to mention names because I just see it across the board that especially on the indie level, it seems like for every, in my mind, really good talent, there's five to ten get-the-hell-out-of-this-business kind of talents, if I even want to call them a talent. Meaning, I feel like on the indies, I'm seeing a lot of guys that, all right, I'll throw on my t-shirt, I won't really work out, you know, my hair looks messy, I haven't really fixed up my beard or I don't shave, and I'm going to go out there and, oh, I just watched Okada match, I'm going to try to repeat a few spots from there. Ooh. And I'm going to I'm gonna kind of wink at the crowd a lot, you know, like almost bring them in a little bit because that's the cool thing to do. Um, I may even laugh at a few things and act like it's no big deal. I won't really care about my entrance as much. I'll just get to the ring or I'll circle the ring a thousand times and clap every freaking hand, which tell me when you see that on TV, I'll answer for you. You don't. They get to the ring. 
I think uh, guys and girl and, and, and the girls too, some of them forget that it's still a competition. We're supposed to look like one. So when people are coming out and, you know, they're just, I don't know, acting like it's a party. And I, I get it. There is that vibe. But just acting like, yeah, whatever, you know. And then afterwards, they're standing in the crowd with the people and, you know, just trying to – there's certain ones that are incognito, then there's certain ones that are like, hey, please notice me. I'm a wrestler, and I just want a few people to come up to me. And ah, it's just not the way that I was trained. And I feel like at the end of the day, treat it like a competition, whether legitimately the person from across the ring or yourself. And I just feel like there's a lackadaisical approach when it comes to certain a, a percentage of indie wrestlers out there. Now, when you wrestle someone like that, you know, what goes through your mind? I mean, like, you know, this is going to come, you know, I'm sure already it's just too late to say that it's going to come off arrogant or judgmental, but I do realize, and this is a hard thing for me with wrestling to realize, but I've gotten better with it over time. I would think I, uh, had a hard time realizing that not everybody wants to get, to a TV level. Not everybody wants to go to WWE. And I never understood that until more recently. And I've been, this is almost seven years now. So in my mind, even when I was going to a couple indie shows here and there, before I started training, I would ask a friend of mine who was bringing me to his shows, like, Hey, what about this guy, this guy, this guy, like, I don't get it. This guy is like, I was kind of judging him for the same things I was just saying. And he was like, well, not everybody wants to go to WWE or TNA or or which there was no AEW at the time. And I was like, what? I was like, why would you want to, you know, risk injury? Why would you want to do this and not be at the highest level? And that's one thing, I guess that's just my, that's my competitive drive is I don't understand getting into something like this and thinking I'm not going to go higher than this and I'm okay with that or I don't want to go higher than this. So I realized that that is, that's okay. Some people just want to keep it low key. They want to be a weekend warrior. That's, that's totally okay. And there's plenty of people who are not. At the end of the day, though, I'm not going to, like, stiff anybody just because they're not of my thinking. Regardless, people make fun of me for being stiff, but I'm not. I've never actually heard anybody, so let me clarify that. But for me, it's just, uh, you know, you work to who you're in the ring with. So whether that's a good or a bad thing. So sometimes you're going to be working down. No offense. There's going to be people that you're like, okay, I'm not doing X, Y, and Z because – they can't really do that. Maybe I might try something. They might drop me and kill me and vice versa. This person is not athletic. So I'm not going to do this, that, and the other. I'm not going to be stupid. I'm going to still change based on who's in front of me. And then there's certain people where I'm like, holy crap, I can't believe I'm getting in the ring with fill in the blanks. And now I'm working up to them. And then, and then comes the whole, like, how am I going to do this? I can't believe you know what I mean. Like, you know, I'm not going to change my formula too much. I'm still going to be me, but depending on who's in front of me and how athletic they are and how hard they're willing to work, that'll change, you know, the same for me. Well, I mean, obviously it's been working for you. Uh, you know, we've seen you on TV before. We've seen you on NXT. We even saw you Monday Night Raw. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about those experiences? Uh, yeah, so the first time also did Impact too, but that was a little under the radar. The same week we did Raw. Dude, that's that right. On, I almost forgot about that. Yes, Impact. That was on their show, Explosion. So back in June of 2019, that was my first time doing something for WWE. I went to NXT. Uh, I wrestled Keith Lee. By wrestled, I mean got murdered, <laughs> um, which I'm proud. That's totally okay. So that was just a great learning experience, just being there. Anybody, I'm sure, who's done it knows, especially the first time. It's overwhelming when you pull up and, who am I letting cut in front of me? Oh, Nigel McGuinness, okay. And then I'm getting out and I'm like, oh, hey, and there's whoever it may be, you know, Adam Cole, just walking into it. I go, this is insane. And then walking in, it's just crazy because they were setting up for a cage match with Yo and Shayna and you're seeing this cage and Triple H is in there. They're reinforcing the cage and Shawn Michaels and Road Dogs on a headset and people are going over their stuff and you're just like, holy, you know. That's surreal. Like, it is it is one of those like, wow. And for me, when I got out there to go up against Keith, I will say this. Um Honestly speaking, granted, look, I was out there for barely 90 seconds, so it's not like at a 15-minute banger. But I walked out there, and the second I got through and walked down the ramp, I did not feel nervous at all. In fact, when I first looked out at the crowd, uh, packed uh, full sail, I felt, like, comfortable. And I got to felt- say, w- watching you during that, like, you, when I talked to you about before about BWF having that, that intensity, that look in your eye, you brought that same look 
to NXT. It wasn't like lost in the deer in the headlights or anything like that. It was still like the Nikos Rikos that we know. It felt right. And all I can say is like when I got in the ring, I was it. And they let me be me, which was, wow, tremendous because I did not expect that. But when I got out there, I was like, it felt right. I remember thinking to myself, yeah, yeah, I need, I need to get back here. Like I need to permanently. Like this is where I, I need to be here. Then the second time around was the uh, the, Vi- the Viking Raiders. It was called the, the War Raiders. The Viking Raiders, along with um, one of the guys from my school, who was also a trainer at Creative Pro New Jersey Wrestle Pro, Bobby Wayward. We were the uh, East Hampton Polo Boys, and <laughs> yeah, also, man, also got crushed. But again, even a bigger experience because you just see the production that goes into a day's work there, and it's. Again, even just the things like fans don't either think about or realize, and not that they should um, necessarily because they're not there, but when you're looking at how many people are in the building and how there's a team just focusing on, you know, at the time they were doing the wedding segment with Lana and Lashley and how many people just to put the cake together and then how many people are putting the stage up and you're just looking at, you know, how many people are working on the ring and just laying the floor down. And like, you can run reduction at just the amount of people that are there in hard hats and, like, busting their asses off. And then afterwards, like, everybody's leaving, and there's just hundreds of staff, again, in hard hats and whatnot, just waiting for the crowd to leave so they can get out there and break everything down. And you're looking at these trucks, and you're like, this is insane. You know, that experience, again, being out there on Raw, it felt comfortable. And Bobby is awesome. I can't say enough good things about Bobby. He's as trainers as well he started a year before me that i've learned a lot from he worked for me for ewf once um and we both were we had a great time we felt comfortable when we went out there and even though it was on commercial we were being obnoxious to the uh fans at ringside doing our stretches m- massaging each other telling each other how good we looked fixing each other's hair you look like a hampton boy man absolutely i've hung out quite a bit out there in the hamptons you fit right in <laughs> yeah and uh xavier woods tweeted east hampton polo boys for life that <laughs> night so i know he was a fan of it according to twitter oh it was a great gimmick it reminded me of like the mean street posse almost yes and i was reached out to by i call him a friend now um bull james who loved it he was like this is what he's like i see this for you he's like i love this so just something to think about no, absolutely. And you look comfortable in both spots, on NXT and on Raw. But, you know, you just um, – it looked like you belonged there. You know, I, and obviously that's something you've been working towards. And um, hopefully when things get back to normal, hopefully you'll get your chance to go back there. That's the goal. I think you, you watch the current product. Oh, yeah, of course. When you watch, like, WWE or, or uh, NXT, AEW, or even, uh, even uh, in, on the indie level – what interests you when you watch a match? What stands out to you when you're watching someone? For me, it's the old school, or at least I consider the old school, the element of the story. Um, so as amazing as some talents are from the athletic standpoint and from the stuff they do, the move, the sequences, which are mind-blowing, for me, it's the story that's being told in the ring, and it's the, it's, it's the moments, really, because... Mm. One of the things I always look back on is when you think of a match, like, for example, my favorite match of all time is WrestleMania 25, Undertaker, and HBK. Hell yeah, um, man. High five on that one. <laughs> yeah, and one thing about that match is you don't really think about any moves from that match. You think about, oh, when Sean kicked out, remember the look on Taker's face? That's the or, number one thing I remember from that. Right, or remember when Sean made his entrance and he came from – up above and Taker came from underneath and but the first thing you go to is the moments when you talk about Brett and Austin you don't talk about the moves you talk about Austin's you know quote unquote the crimson mask right when you think about Shawn Michaels and Bret Hart you think about like the final moments when Shawn's on his knees clutching the title so in my mind too I don't feel like a lot of people go Remember that move that that guy did in that match? Like, yeah, people will talk about that. But even when you look at, uh, to bring up something modern day, uh, Will Ospreay and, oh my God, his name is freaking slipping me. He was even in the Cruiserweight Classic, I think. Anyway, they did a move where, went for like a top rope Hurricane Rana, and they, let's put it this way, they both ended up off the top rope, Duo Rana, on their feet. And I remember the camera, even in New Japan, caught, I think it was, uh, was it Ishii? Was, they caught his face, and behind him, Osprey, like, Ishii felt like, oh, he landed, like, Osprey must have taken the bump, blah, blah, blah. 
But little as you know, Osprey standing behind him. And it was like in a movie. Like he turned his head like, is this guy actually on his feet? And the, the camera work of him being so stunned that Osprey landed on his feet. I'm not describing it well, but everybody, I'm sure there's people that are smashing their heads against the wall wanting to kill me for not getting this. <laughs> right. But basically, it's just those moments. Uh, Keith Lee and Dijak did it too. There was a moment in a, one of their matches, one of their classes on NXT, where one of them surprised the other, and there was this like pause and one of them went, are you kidding me right now? And they turned around, they had this crazy stare down. And those are the things that, in my mind, people go to. So well, I'm glad you said Keith people, Lee with that, because I was going to say, too, like, you know, uh, when you talk about facial expressions, so with the one person that sticks out to me right now uh, in the modern day wrestling is Keith Lee. I feel like he's already mastered those facial expressions. That absolutely. Go I mean, again, I don't, I don't mean to bring it back to me, but I'm going to do so. Um, when, I, when I had that quick match with him, there was that moment where I just... Uh, I gave him a uh, chop to the chest and he just, he gave me that look. It wasn't like this intense, I'm going to kill you look. It was just that, oh man, I'm going to, come on, man. Like, you know, <laughs> look at me, look at you, you're, you're dead. And those ultimately connect. So when it's talking about what I appreciate, what I look forward to or enjoy the most, it's the moments. No, absolutely, so. man. Like, um, I feel like, you know, we're not getting as many moments lately in professional wrestling because it's just highlighted by what, what did I do last time? Well, how could I do better as far as the moves? How can I wow you? And right. um, I don't know about you, but I, I kind of feel like I see that in the indies too, don't you? Well, yeah, that's definitely part of it. Um, when I was being critical of some of the things I've seen out there is exactly what I said before, where it's sometimes guys who are not caring. And then there's ones who, oh, Omega and Okada had some crazy match. Let's try to do those things we just saw. This coming Saturday night, you know, in the Bronx or in Rahway. But they're trying to emulate a style they can't do. And, you know, they forget that some of these guys, like, <sighs> AJ Styles was like a new leader and a gymnast. I mean, he didn't just start doing these things. Like, you know, you look at certain guys, they're training. Alistair Black is trained in, you know, various forms of MMA. He's not just, so you got guys who are like, oh, yeah, I could do that. It's but like, he, you know, you even you mentioned, guys, even you mentioned AJ Styles, who's a phenomenal athlete. Right. Like, we just we all saw the WrestleMania match he had with the Undertaker. He didn't do any of his regular moves. He didn't necessarily show off his athleticism, but that was a hell of a match because it told a story. Like AJ, everybody's talking about that. Yeah, yeah. AJ Styles, he knows less is more. Just because he can do it doesn't necessarily mean he does do it. And Shawn Michaels was the same way. Exactly. And the, the thing with Shawn, the number one thing that I think of when I think of the Shawn Michaels match is the way that you know he'd be hurting his back is killing him and before he gets to uh tune up the band he's crawling up the ropes he's using the ropes to pull himself up he's looking around almost asking the crowd the same way ricky morton would like you know come on help me out here like the one thing that stands out for me with Shawn michaels a, a great moment was his match with rick flair uh right before he gave the super kick he Damn. says i'm sorry I love you. Boom. Everybody remembers that. Nobody remembers like certain certain moves and spots, whatever. They remember that. Right. And you know, I see it with you as well, man. Like, you know, your 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 game is more ground based. You're you're more it's almost like an old school style watching you and I appreciate that because you know, it, it is less and more. You can do more. I I've seen you do more, but like it's it's just so interesting to watch you, and I think that's how you stand out um, in your matches. And plus, you you and Vicky, you guys always tell a story. It depends who you're in there with, and that goes back to one of your original questions where there are things that I normally do that, depending on who I'm in the ring with, for better or for worse, I should or shouldn't or can or can. So there's certain times where if I'm, again, I'm going to go back to a Bull James, I do a move, a jumping gut buster, where the guy goes for a cross body, I jump up at the same time, I catch him in a gut buster. I'm not doing that with Bull. <laughs> right. Um, that's what you do with Brother gonna... Greatness, but not with Bull. Right. <laughs> I'm not going to ask, just because that's my move doesn't mean, hey, I got to get this move in. When I look at a guy like Bull, am I going to do my usual stuff? Like, nah, not really. I'm going to try to cut him down. So I'm going to be more on the basic, I don't know, what fans might consider boring side for that time because my goal in the ring is to get Bull off his feet however I can. So I don't need to be doing crazy athletic things. I don't need to expect him to do it either because he's going to be looking to overpower me. So why am I going to say, hey, I want to you know, do this jump and go poster? Like, it depends who you're in there with. Right, and and there goes everything right. you fought so hard for. And that's the last And that's what, what I think indie guys do is sometimes they feel like, oh, yeah, I'll just do it because that's my thing. It's like, well, guys in WWE, they're co-workers on a weekly basis. They trust each other. They know each other. They know... You know, 
doing these matches on house shows. They're not just doing them on Raw or SmackDown. So if I'm meeting a guy for the first time and I have bad vibes about uh, him picking me up for a driver, then I won't do it. Right. No, you, you got to stand your ground. And, uh, no, I mean, and vice versa. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Nikos, we're almost running out of time. Uh, I think Abel's going to kill me if I don't bring this up. You know, you travel quite a bit for what you do. And uh, one of the places you recently went to was Alaska to wrestle. Would love to hear about that. Yeah, so um, right around this time last year was the first Wrestle Pro Alaska, and then the second one was December, yeah. Um, so I've never been there before, obviously. have not traveled that far for wrestling. Uh, Kevin Matthews of Create a Pro, Wrestle Pro, he's like the head booker, you say. Uh, he's the one who established uh, this relationship out there. Uh, he vacationed there once and loved it. WWE does not go there often because – it's very hard. Like you basically have to fly everything to Alaska, so it's not there. I don't think they've been there since like 2006 or seven or something. I didn't even like that. know WWE's been there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Me neither. And he felt like there's a hungry fan base out there, so he established a relationship with uh, a promoter out in Alaska. They got a bunch of sponsorships together. It was a, really a phenomenal job. And uh, it was amazing just to experience Alaska. You know, it's a very different over there. I don't just mean from the, you know, it's colder, a little darker, but you know, just a very different, like, uh, you know, laid back feel out there. Uh, you know, weed is legal. So that was the first time being in a place where I'm like, oh, okay, everybody's high. Oh, um, wow. I didn't even then, know that. Yeah. And then in December, second time around, again, another great experience. TJ Wilson was there, Tyson Kidd, Bret Hart. And it's just cool because there's like everybody's with each other. Like the first time Cole Cabana did a comedy show, so we all went. It was uh, tremendous. So it was really cool. And uh, everybody's so welcoming there. And they're excited to have the wrestlers in town. And the sponsors, they do a tremendous part of promoting it. And we've had good crowds every time. We are we're supposed to go back this week, I just realized. Oh, no, that, really? <laughs> uh, so that has to be pushed back. I believe we are doing two shows at the end of this year and officially there is now a separate promotion called wrestle pro alaska uh so that's a whole separate thing now where you know wrestle pro alaska is basically a promotion out there it was definitely a different but really cool especially from a wrestling standpoint those people are loud and excited because they don't get a lot of wrestling up there at all from what i understand it used to be a, a pretty big territory back in the territory days yeah, honestly speaking, I don't know much about the wrestling Alaska history. I've heard that before, but I haven't done my diligence of like really, I guess, educating myself on it. I just know that in modern times, in like more recent times, there's not a lot going on there or any with wrestling. But even the guys up there and the girls, like the workers that I've met, and I've worked with a few of them now at each show, have been like tremendous. Like they're such nice people. Like nobody's like greedy. They all are working for the show. Yeah, you know, it's, it's a like the workers up there, uh, Brian Adams, uh, Jack Windsor, Jerry Bishop, to name the guys that I've worked with, have been awesome. Well, hopefully, uh, your trip by the end of the year will happen uh, yeah. at some point. I can't imagine there being many cases of COVID nineteen in Alaska, but what do I know? <laughs> <laughs> but Nikos, thank you so much for joining us for this interview. Uh, when I heard that you were going to be someone that was going to be interviewed for us, I had to jump on that right away. Uh, like I said, you're one of my favorite guys in BWF outside of my squad. So uh, thank you again for joining us. So you know, Mark, I've got, I've, I've got one quick thing to say, if you don't mind me. Cutting yeah, off. sure. Two things. I'm going to keep it quick. First, we're going to clear the air on something. I had, I had, it's over now. But I'm going to bring it up anyway, a little bit of a bone to pick with you. Oh, no. Where um, one of the first times, after one of the first times I met you, I listened to, I, I watched back to a BWF show, and Vicious Vicky's having her match. And I'm listening to the commentary and, uh, you know, really talking about how much Vicky loves Taylor Swift and how, you know, you're also a Taylor Swift fan, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, where the hell is this guy getting his information from? Right. She only, she only likes Taylor Swift because of me, pal. <laughs> Yo, well, not for nothing. Vicious Vicky did correct me in that the next show. Um, oh, I, think, I know, but I had to bring it up. Well, I think when I talked to you guys, I talked to you guys together, I think you mentioned something about Taylor Swift. And I, somehow my notes, I got them both together. I don't know. That's on me. 
Of course. She's, she's into screaming music and all that crazy <laughs> stuff. And second story, a uh, quick little side thing. Um, I just want to do a quick little shout out, and it is wrestling based. If you have uh, 30 seconds for a quick story. Yeah, for uh, sure. One of my favorite, two of my favorite rescues, I already mentioned the Westchester Rescue Hamster Haven and the Pip Squeakery. Little side note recently, the Pip Squeakery has a little bit of a wrestling connection. Alistair Black is a big supporter of them, of all people. Wow, and I did not know that. The owners of the Pip Squeakery, Alex and Jason, they're not really into wrestling. I know Jason was a fan, but Alex recently, he had reached out to them. And um, long story short, he did a shout out for them on Instagram. And they contacted me because they had named a guinea pig after him, which he, I know, shouted out. He loved it. They asked me, hey, we've got a litter of guinea pigs being born. You know, we want to name them after wrestlers. What can we name them? So long story short, the, the new four additions are Zelina, Angel, after Angel Garza, Andrade, and she really took a liking to the name Finn after, well, you know. Right. So, uh, which they made a pair, they made public in a post, and Alistair Black acknowledged it, and he, I know he thought it was great. So I thought, cool little side story that uh, there is a wrestling rodent rescue uh, connection there with uh, WWE and the Pip Squeakery of all places. But that that's great. is amazing. Yes, this will definitely make the final cut for that one. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, Look, cut out Vicky stuff. Just leave that in. <laughs> oh, poor Vicky. She'll probably kill me if that's the case. This, this is how I am with her. She knows. I'm, I'm, I'm just a fan, I guess. <laughs> Nikos, where can we find you on social media? Facebook, Nikos Ricos, uh, Instagram, and Twitter. Uh, they're both at OPA, OPA underscore Nikos Rikos, N I K O S, N I K O S. And then you, know, you can find me wherever I'm wrestling. Just follow me. I'll be posting about it. So. Hell yeah, man. This is Nikos Rikos. Thank you for listening to the best podcast, A Shot of Wrestling on Spotify. But we are not done yet. Stay tuned for Last Call. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, I need to announce it's Last, last call, call at, at the, the bar. bar. Oh. All right, guys, this is Last Call. I'm here with the Spartan Pitbull, Nikos Rikos. Nikos, are you ready for this? I'm ready. All right, so first question. Who, in your opinion, is the most underappreciated wrestler in history? <sighs> Christian. Ooh, all right. Yeah. Agreed in there. What are you currently watching? Um, so I'm in a time machine at the moment. I just finished watching Lost. I did watch it was on the air. I never finished it. Vicky and I rewatched from episode one, and it was even better than I remember when I first watched it. All right. So what is your favorite pay-per-view? That's going to be the answer everybody probably gives you. It's, it is WrestleMania. What is your favorite team? The New York Mets. All right. Um, what's the best advice you ever received? Um, so it sounds really generic and I've heard this at multiple seminars, you know, podcasts as well. I've been told it to my face after working with certain guys that were in WWE after wrestling with them, being yourself mm. and having that play a huge part into your wrestling character. So, so everything comes natural, like being who you are, but just turning it up to a higher level. And that to me has helped me uh, immensely, I would think. No, absolutely. I mean, I, I think you know, life in general, life advice in general, or wrestling advice, it could be used for either or right there, you know? Absolutely. And uh, being yourself is great advice you give to, you know, just an everyday person, and especially in wrestling. Absolutely. What is your favorite wrestling theme song? Oh, boy. Um, so the first thing that comes to mind is Goldberg's original theme, because Goldberg growing up with my hero, my favorite wrestler of all time. All right. Um, I really feel like saying Jericho's theme though over the years, but I got to go back to the one at childhood from my childhood that captivated me every time I heard it. So I'm going to have to go with Goldberg's theme. Who would you most likely get starstruck by if you met them? I think I know the answer, but I want to be sure. Taylor Swift. I knew it. I knew it. I, I, I think we know it. And, uh, <laughs> Taylor Swift, and I would put up there as number one Taylor Swift, number two Goldberg. Taylor's up there because there's also a love for her on many different levels. I don't care. I'll say it. And then um, Goldberg is like right there. Yeah, I, I, I'm a Swifty myself. I, I think I would uh, I would try to keep it cool, but I might have a mini mark out moment. I might. Yeah, no, I would not keep it cool. I would be proud to not, and I would be proud to not keep it cool. <laughs> Yeah, I, would try, I would try to ask for her hand in marriage right then and there. So. Uh, Vicky might have to face her in her match. Yeah, I don't care. <laughs> That's fine. 
What is your hidden talent? Whoa. Um, my obsession with animals, uh, including most notably, as a lot of people know, uh, my hamsters. I don't really know if it's a talent in terms of like my care for them and the fact that I do occasionally will uh, help out a rescue, actually up in New York, okay. in uh, Mamarick. I will. Okay, I actually have, have done a couple transports for this place um, of hamsters in need. I don't really know if that's a talent. Oh God! Um, there are times when, like you know, I'm like, you know, I think I've got a decent voice, and I've been told before, like, oh, you know, you actually have a, you know, I, I don't know. So maybe somebody else would have to judge that, but maybe I'm not aware of how even good of a singer I am. Let's put it that way. Ooh, all right. We're gonna have to get you in karaoke. Good thing. I'll do it. Now. What was your favorite toy slash action figure when you were a kid? Okay, so we'll just change that around right now because I'm 30 years old and I'm staring at at least, I'd say, maybe 200 wrestling figures in my living room. That's amazing. Um, And next to them is an entire shelf of Batman, probably over 100 figures there. And then across the living room, there's Funko Pops, there's a Star Wars shelf, there's a shelf dedicated just to Boba Fett and the Mandalorian. So in terms of me collecting, I mean, there's stuff I've added to my collection this week. Uh, Damn. Um, you know, I'm going to actually, oh my God, that's tough. I don't really know if I ever had that one figure, though, that, all right, oh, like, he always carries that one around. <laughs> um, I do know that from the time I was like four, there was always something of Batman in my hand. Right now, I will tell you the figure that I sought after for the longest time, and a client of mine got him for me as a Christmas gift, was Pete Dunne's first Mattel Elite figure that was extremely hard to find and extremely expensive on eBay. Hey, man, I think that's the hidden talent right there. (laughs) (laughs) That could be. I don't know if it is. and Yeah, maybe. Well, all right, Nikos Ricos, thank you for joining us for Last Call. And, uh, guys, please join us next week for another episode of Shot of Wrestling. Hey baby, I hear the bell ringing, hip tosses and body slams. Oh my. And maybe you seem a bit confused, yeah baby, but I got you pinned. Ha 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 ha. But I don't know what to do when I see them with that golden case. They're cashing it in. Authority all in my face. What is a man to do? Good night, everybody!